Hi everyone. Welcome to our lecture for chapter 15. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to stockholders equity today. Um, so um, we still have a couple of liabilities to talk about, uh, but we're going to do those towards the end of our um, of our class here. We'll do that when we start looking at uh, in, uh, material for our final. Uh, we're going to pause on the liabilities for a section for a second because uh, def deferred taxes and leases are sort of a special kind of liability. So we're going to save those to the end and we're going to turn our attention to the stockholders equity section of the uh, balance sheet. OK, so I just want to uh, point out a couple things, though, before we jump in to that material and uh, in particular. We have our guest speaker. Our uh, guest speaker is going to be uh, next week, okay? And uh, so you can see the information regarding the uh, guest speaker there and um, what to do in the event that you can't attend that event. I guess some folks have a conflict. You don't need to notify me or anything. You just need to modify your paper to um, address these uh, these changes for those that don't attend the event live and I've given some detailed instructions there okay um, and then there's also the rubric as to how I want you to uh, present the paper and then the link for the um, guest speaker okay the zoom link and it is not our regular class Zoom link, um, but I've provided a um, sort of little template there with Danny Wallace's picture, who will be our speaker, and then there's your Zoom link. Okay, so you have to use that Zoom link right there. Got to use that Zoom link, okay, in order to uh, tune in to the um, event, and then uh, for the few folks that I guess won't be able to make it. Uh, live, I will be posting the Zoom recording somewhere here in uh, eLearning and you'll be able to uh, view that and you will have to view it and you still will have to take a selfie of yourself viewing it somehow. I'm going to hold the camera up here and I need to see you viewing that uh, and then you're going to have to extend your paper by half page explaining uh, what the conflict was and uh, be tactful in the explanation. I don't want you to lecture me about things. I want you to be tactful as though you were explaining to a colleague why you're not able to attend something that they consider to be very important. Okay. And you will be graded for your tactfulness on that. Okay. All right. Good. So that is the update on the guest speaker. Okay. So make sure you're uh, checking that out and following the requirements it's due. April 25th, so I'm going to give you a little time to work on that, um, but don't uh, don't push that. If you don't hit this date, um, that's a zero because um, I need to go to grades, so I can't, you know, hold up the sky waiting for you to to uh, turn that in, so make sure you're turning that in on time. Okay, all right, good. Uh, that is the update there, so what I want to do is, I guess, get back into e-learning, okay? and just uh, point out that we've got this chapter 15 information that we're going to go through and then I'll put up a separate video uh, with the uh, comments on the practice midterm for chapter 15. Okay, all right, good, good, good. So let's go ahead then. And uh, seems like I always have to forget to do something and so I think I forgot to open the slides, but I can open them right here. Should be fine. Okay. Good enough. Go to slideshow. Okay. And let's jump into chapter 15. We're going to have a couple lectures here now on stockholders' equity. In this chapter, we're really going to be dealing with the uh, issuance of shares of stock, both common and preferred. Uh, we're going to talk about what happens um, when uh, we have dividends that are paid out and those dividends, um, you know, can sometimes uh, be treated 
a certain way depending on whether they're dividends for preferred stock or dividends on common stock. Okay, we'll talk about um, reissuing shares or reacquiring shares, um, basically called treasury stock. And then we'll get into some presentation and analysis. Um, we're going to do a couple of quick ratios, no big deal there. Uh, pretty straightforward, easy stuff. Okay. Now we're also going to start out though talking about the corporate form for a business. Okay. So we know that we can have a sole proprietorship, we can have a partnership, we can have a corporation. Okay. And we're really going to be focusing here on corporations, which are entities that issue, uh, incorporate with the state, and then issue stock. That's really where we're focusing. Um, now, a couple of things that uh, about the different forms of business. Uh, the problem with sole proprietorship partnership is what? Unlimited liability, okay? If the company um, in your capacity in your company is a sole proprietor, you default on a bill or something like that, um, they could come after the owner's personal assets to collect on that bill, whatever, right? To collect on that debt. Um, same thing with a partnership, okay? Partnership uh, does not insulate anyone from uh, personal liability. With a corporation, what happens? Well, now the corporation is seen as a separate legal entity. And so any liabilities of that corporation stop at the corporation's door and they don't come after the personal uh, assets of the uh, owners. For example, if you have a share of stock in Apple and for whatever reason, you know, Apple defaulted on some liability, they don't come to your house and say, hey, you owe, you know, $25 your share of this liability for Apple, right? So you're limited to your share of the uh, corporate uh, liabilities and then it stops there. They don't come after your personal assets. Now, you would say, well, why would anybody be a sole proprietorship or a partnership? Well, ease of formation. So for a sole proprietorship, you're a barber, you hang up a barber's pole. Of course, you'd have to be licensed to do barber work through the uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, but you don't have to do anything uh, to start that business other than follow whatever the regulatory laws are associated with that type of business. Um, partnership, you bring in a partner because what? You're the expert at haircutting, but the other person's the expert at the nail aspect of a barber shop or beauty shop, whatever. And so you bring in a nail partner. Okay, so you're just trying to expand your business. And that's pretty easy to form that type of business. With the corporation, as you can see down here, you are subject to the incorporation laws of a particular state. Okay, so you have to follow state incorporation laws. Okay. Um, now, one of the advantages of the corporate, along with the legal, uh, limited legal liability, is this notion that, hey, I can trade my ownership very easily over to somebody else. So I sell you the shares of stock. If I own 20% of the company now, you own 20% of the company when I sell you that stock, and it's fairly easy to uh, change. Okay. Okay, good. And if we want to get additional owners, we just issue additional shares of stock. Now, when you're forming a corporation, though, you do follow the laws of the state. So you file your articles of incorporation, your, your corporate charter with the state. Um, California, New York tend to be states that are fairly difficult to form the corporation, whereas Delaware is always the example of the state that uh, it's a little easier to form the corporation under those state laws. I think I've heard New Jersey is a similar state where it's not quite as honest as some of the bigger states or states where a lot of people want to live like New York, California. Um, those states tend to be a little more difficult. Okay. And so what we're going to be looking at is some of the accounting, but in some cases the accounting is governed by the requirements of the state in terms of the amount of par value on stock. And we'll start to take a look at some of those things. Okay, so that's our um, corporate capital, our capital stock share system. Okay, so we when we say we'll share proportionally in profit and losses, 
Um, you know, it's not like because they have net income, they automatically send you a check of your portion of the net income. It is assumed that that increase in wealth goes proportionally to the shareholders, but there are a lot of things that drive the value of a stock, say the market value of the stock, drive the market value of stock other than earnings. Um, for example, if the entity is developing a new patent and that information is on the market and they're ready, getting ready to you know, uh, be able to get approval for that patent and whatnot, something like that could be driving the value of the stock. Overall feelings about the economy could drive the value of a stock. So it's not just limited to the finance reports. I know as accountants, we'd like to think that everybody sits there waiting for the annual report and find financial report, and that's how they make all their decisions. It's just one piece of many uh, that would go in to that decision process, okay? And um, I'm getting a call, guys, right, that I'm gonna have to take here. So um, bear with me while I pause for uh, okay, so let's continue on there. Um, talking about the capital stock of an entity and um, the share system. Um, so again, you incorporate with the state and then you're going to have these different shares and again, share proportionately in profits and losses. They're not gonna send a check to you every time they have income, but when dividends are paid, then yes, those dividends are typically proportionate to the number of shares that you own. Uh, the right to vote, okay? Uh, that typically comes with common stock. We're gonna talk about preferred stock. Preferred stock generally has a preference to dividends or if there's a liquidation of the company how they receive liquidation and in exchange for those dividend and liquidation preferences, they give up the right to vote. Common shares tend to be last in line if there is a liquidation, uh, but um, they uh, get the opportunity to vote and they get the dividends after the preferred, okay? So when we say share pro uh, proportionately in assets upon liquidation, let's say, and I'm just gonna do a little crude drawing down here, the company goes bankrupt. Okay, you start this corporation, they go bankrupt. Uh, who gets in line? Well, the first people that get in line for distribution of assets, right, as assets get distributed, are going to be the accountants, okay, and the lawyers. They get paid first because they have the ones that figure out who gets what, so accountants and lawyers would get paid first to figure out who's going to get the um, distribution, okay? Then if there are taxes that have to be paid, those will be paid. Then um, lenders get paid, okay? And lenders, if they are secured, they'll get paid first. Then we get some certain, you know, employees. We get any money that's owed to them. And then we have unsecured lenders, general creditors. Okay, then we start getting into the preferred shareholders. Then we start getting into the common shareholders, okay? So by the time we get to, you know, your common shareholders, okay, they're last, essentially. And by the time they get to them, as you can imagine, there's pennies on the dollar, okay? So the preferred are a little bit in front of the common, that's what we mean about uh, preferences in terms of liquidation preferences in, in terms of uh, dividends. And then sometimes um, there could be, this is not 100%, but if there are new issuances of stock, sometimes companies will offer it to their existing shareholders yet. They call that a preemptive right because you can maintain your percentage of the voting rights. They're gonna issue some more stock. You say, okay, 
well, these additional issues that are coming out, I'm going to take out enough of those shares to um, protect my interest. Or maybe even you can buy some shares that allow you to uh, get an increase uh, interest and sometimes you know the stock that you get will carry with it a preemptive right um, so this is sometimes you re read about these sort of well, I started out in the mail room of the company and now I'm on the board of directors and it was probably because they sat there and they used preemptive right on stocks that they held and they hung around long enough you know a lot of times these guys make it sound like they were a genius that they were in the mail room and now they're you know the on the board of directors and you look and the guy's you know 197 years old well hell if you can hang around that long then there's preemptive rights yeah you could end up on the board of directors if you kind of watch that or smart enough to watch that and acquire those shares as it moves along okay okay good um taking a look at the uh, common stock um as i mentioned uh, a second ago with the common stock um it uh, bears the ultimate risk of loss okay the common stock was sort of down there at the very bottom as we saw okay uh receives the benefits of success by that meaning that as the company um you know does better and the market value of the stock goes up then those common shares are going to of course increase in value um, but there is no guarantee, right? High risk, high reward. The risk is that if things go south, uh, although you're limited to your investment in the stock, they're going to come and say, hey, guess what? In most cases, there could be a, if they issue the stock below par, there's this, you know, unusual circumstance where there could be um, contingent liability to the shareholders that if they bought the stock below par, that they could be held accountable to make up the amount below par that they held. Um, very unusual uh, sort of circumstance. So for the most part, you're limited to whatever your initial investment was in that stock. Um, they don't come and ask you for more money if the company goes bankrupt. By the same token, you lose that, okay, if there's not enough assets left over to distribute that to you okay uh preferred stock okay they sacrifice certain rights the big one is the right to vote in most cases uh, and return for other privileges which is the dividend preference and then again we don't like to think about this too much i don't want to go on and on about liquidation of a corporation but is if there is such um, then uh, they would get their share of whatever is left before the common shareholders would Okay. All right. If this is seeming interesting to you guys, stop because <laughs> we're going to get into the accounting here pretty quick. Okay. So let's just start to take a look at the stockholders equity account and um, what it looks like. Okay. So as you know, we have what we have our uh, retained earnings. Okay. As part of our stockholders equity. Okay, retained earnings is obviously earned capital. I don't know if I need to write that. I mean, it's called retained earnings. This is earned capital, right? And then we have what? We have our contributed capital. I've also seen this called paid in capital. Okay, so contributed paid in capital consists of our common stock and our preferred stock and that account holds whatever was paid in at par or if it's no par stock with no stated value then it's whatever was paid in for that stock so that's at par and then and this um, they call this additional paid in capital this is the amount that is in excess of par so if you buy a share of stock and these share these stocks have a very very low par value generally one cent so you pay more than one cent for a stock right what happens the amount over par that you pay and that's driven by the stock market right the amount over par that you paid would go into this additional paid in capital in excess of par account okay and then as part of our 
uh, equation for our stockholders' equity, if we reacquire shares, that's called treasury stock, that is taken off of the uh, stockholders' equity as a subtract. It's a contra to my stockholders' equity as I reacquire those shares. And we're going to talk about the accounting for all of this. Okay, so assets minus liabilities equal equity. Here is really a good chunk of our equity uh, that we talk about in this class. Okay, this is a little bit of a twisted, I don't know what shape you'd call that. It's not a circle. Looks like an internal combustion engine or something. But anyway, that is considered our equity right there. Okay, now you also have your comprehensive income, which we don't talk about in this class, and that's a subject. It's part of stockholders' equity, but that's a different subject. Okay? Okay, good. Let's take a look. When I say different subject, I guess you covered that in uh, 100A uh, at some point in time. Okay? Okay, good. Corporate capital. When we look at the stock, we've got par value stock. We've got no par stock. Okay? Uh, and that's where we're going to spend a good st uh, structure of our time here, understanding how to account for these different types of stocks up here. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at a couple things now about the par value of the stock. And by the way, if this uh, slide is looking funny to you, you're saying, where did that come from? I uh, had initially posted up. Um, this and then as I get ready for our discussion I start to say oh you know I'd really like to have some additional things here and I stuck these in and then um, reposted so if you're missing this page you might want to pause go ahead print out this slide and um, then come back if you want to highlight or whatever along with me okay so we've got stock okay and generally stock has a par value but there could be something called no par stock, okay? And it could be true no par stock, or it could have a stated value. So even though the stock is no par, to limit certain potential liabilities to the stockholders and whatnot, or the state, again, a lot of how we have to structure these stock issuances has to deal with state law. It's our job as accountant more that once we know the nature of the stock, how do we account for that transaction, okay? So we have what? We have no par, true no par, where there is no stated value, or no par with a stated value in which they'll call out a stated value, okay? And again, as I was saying a minute ago on the previous slide, any amounts that are paid in in excess of par or in excess of the stated value is called additional paid in capital. Sometimes, you know, they're just very long-winded but very descriptive, additional paid in capital in excess of par. I think in this class, um, when you and I talk about this, you're going to see me often refer to it as APIC. Okay, I'm not a big abbreviation guy, but that's one that I like. Additional paid in capital in excess of par. I worked for the federal government for years, you know, and federal... Uh, employees get they fall in love with the acronyms you know they're well it's the dod and it's the dot and you know and it's the doe and i'm like dot is that department of transportation you know i'm sitting there doe is that department of energy you know i'm sitting there and i'll always be behind in the discussion because i can't remember what all these alphabet soup of uh <laughs> of acronyms are so when I was running a job, I'd put a moratorium on acronyms. If you want me to know that you're talking about the Department of Energy and not the Department of Education, you need to say Department of Energy, Department of Education. Because you're sitting there saying DOE. She thinks you're talking about Department of Education. I'm thinking Department of Energy. You know, so we can't tab this. It gets dysfunctional at some point. Anyway. Enough. Okay, so what happens, and I'm talking to myself, enough, John. Now, when we look at our share, our stock, we have, to, and we have to report this, okay? This needs to be reported in our stockholders equity section on our balance sheet, okay? And when we do that, we have to call up the number of stairs authorized, issued, and outstanding. Now, what happens? 
when a company incorporates in the Articles of Incorporation, it'll say, you are authorized, and I'm going to go, you know, with small numbers here, guys. You are authorized... say 10,000 shares. Most companies would have more than that. And I think you can go back after and you know amend your articles in corporation to get authorized for more. But let's say initially you're authorized for uh, 10,000. Okay, now, does a company have to issue all the shares they're authorized? No. Let's say the company issues 7,000 shares. Okay, so they issue 7,000 shares. They don't have to issue every share they're authorized. And then let's say they reacquire 1,000 shares. And we call that treasury stock. So we issued 7,000. We reacquired, I don't know if I said 1,000, let's say. Okay, I'm just making this up. Okay, we reacquired treasury stock of 1,000 shares. So the shares that are outstanding then are going to be 6,000. Okay, so they didn't issue all the shares they were authorized. They issued 7,000. They reacquired, and when you reacquire treasury stock, we'll talk about this later, you do it right out in the open market. You reacquire your own shares out in the open market for whatever the market value is of those at that time, and you take off the amount of treasury stock off the shares issued. That's the shares that are outstanding. And the most important thing about this outstanding is that if there are dividends that are paid, they are paid on the shares that are outstanding. Okay? Okay, good. So that's basically what they're saying with all those words up there. You have to talk in your... Um, in your financial report on your balance sheet you have to call out the number of shares that are what authorized issued and outstanding and of course you show that subtracted treasury stock so you have to show that as well okay okay good now when we talk about common stock it is the basic ownership interest in the corporation okay I think we've already seen it bears the ultimate risk of loss, okay? There are no guarantees on dividends, okay? However, the trade-off is that we are generally going to do what? Share in control of the management. They have the right to vote, uh, to share in earnings eventually once dividends and any other liquidations and whatnot happen, et cetera. I think we've kind of already talked about a lot of this, okay? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's issue our common stock, okay? And uh, I think you know some of these. Uh, typically, par value is pretty low, and we do this. Um, and um, we are also gonna have a separate account for preferred and common and um, then amounts over par are called additional paid in capital uh, paid in capital in excess of par in this class we're going to call it uh, apic okay and so you go ahead and you take a look at this issuance right here the stock had a par value of ten dollars you take that times the number of shares that gets credited to the common stock account they issued it for 4500 so the amount that is paid in in excess of par is this $1,500. And, of course, you're receiving the cash, so you debit the cash. Okay, and I think, you know, you've uh, seen this um, several times probably, you know, uh, as you've looked at accounting here over the last uh, little while, and so that should be a big shock. Okay, so that's... Pretty, uh, pretty straight, straightforward there uh, as to how we would account for a transaction of that nature. Okay, okay, good. So let's go ahead then and let's take a look at um, uh, the issuance of what happens if we have uh, no par stock now. Okay, 
And so um, with our no par stock, okay, we've seen that transaction. Our no par stock now, um, if there is no par, it avoids any contingent uh, liability because there was no par. It's impossible to buy the stock at less than par. And so there's no chance of that weird outside chance that somehow the shareholders would be seen as uh, being contingent liability to come up to par by buying the stock below par because there is no par. You can't go below uh, zero. Okay. Um, now, what happens though, a major disadvantage of no par stock, and that's why we'll see uh, some companies will use stated value on a no par stock, uh, is that some states levy a high tax on no par uh, stock when those are uh, issued. In addition, some states, uh, the total price for no par stock may be considered legal capital, which will reduce flexibility. So what a lot of companies will do uh, to avoid some of these disadvantages is they'll come up with a stated value. And the stated value will replace the par value, and then we're right back to where any amounts over now replace the word par with stated, any amounts over stated value would go to additional paid in capital. And I guess that's why they don't always like to call it an excess of par, because in that case, it would be an excess of stated value. Okay. Okay, good. Um, oh, uh, avoids confusion over recording par value versus um, market value. I don't know who's confusing. They're trying to clear up. Um, but let's just be clear in what um, what happens, right? You set a par value of the stock, five dollars per par, and sometimes you know these par values can go back. You know, how long has the SEC been around? Nineteen thirty-four. So you know, companies that incorporated under SEC requirements way back when, and of course, you incorporate under your state's requirements, but. You know, the modern day trading of stock is already, what, 100, getting up to 100 years old, okay? And so some of these stocks for some of these companies maybe were issued way, 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 way back, even before 1934, when prices, of course, were much lower. So, you know, some of these pars are tied to that. So you may have a $5 par, okay? And, of course, the market value of these stocks now, if, you know, somebody woke up, from the dead and came back and saw what stocks are trading for now, they wouldn't believe it, right? You know, what, a thousand dollars a share, that kind of thing. And so the market value generally differs significantly from the par value. And so, and as I've said, sometimes the par values are in the fraction of a cent. Okay, so, um, you know, there's a big difference between what happens with the market value of the stock and the par value since tends to stay, which fluctuates and the par value tends to stay constant, right? Okay, so we come over, and this is an example of a true no par stock. Okay, so what is it? $10 per share, we issued 500 shares, that's $5,000, debit cash credit the common stock, okay? Now, if it is a uh, stated value, which is 15, and the par is, uh, yeah, stated value of five dollars per share, uh, it becomes the par value. And we issue a thousand shares, and we issue that for fifteen. Okay, so now we have the cash of fifteen thousand. The common stock we didn't have a par, but we had a stated value. But it's like as though we had a par value a thousand times the five dollars, and then the remaining ten dollars per share times a thousand shares is ten thousand. Okay, easy, easy stuff, guys. Okay, I'm not gonna litter your midterm with stuff like this. You know, I might have one question like this or something. I think you know uh, this very well from introductory, right? Okay, no big deal there, okay? Now, what happens? When we, uh, in, in the occasion that we do one big issue and there's some shares of common and there's some shares of, say, preferred in there, how will we allocate that total issue price to the common and to the preferred shares? Something like that happens, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at these two methods. You know, the proportional method, method to me seems to make the most sense. They have this incremental method, which seems a bit, uh, I don't know, kind of a little false 
to me. So I prefer what we see on the next method, uh, next slide, the proportional method, but I guess somebody could use this incremental method. It's, I guess there's nothing wrong with it, okay? Proportional says this, says look, um, we have these two different issues, common and preferred, okay? And we're going to be issuing them for the lump sum um, of uh, 13,500, okay? So it's the common and the preferred, right? Uh, 300 shares of common, 100 shares of preferred. They give us the uh, relative par values and we issue them for 13.5, okay? Now, common shares have a market value of 20 and the uh, preferred shares have a market value of 90. So we pick those two numbers up times the number of shares that you saw up there, okay? And just leveraging off of the market values of the two shares, the common constitutes 40% of the market value, whereas the preferred constitutes 60% of the market and so we use those percentages then the 50 and the 60 multiply that by what this total bucket of money we got this 13 5 lump sum that we got and we allocate 5 4 to the common 8100 to the preferred and then of course we have the 13 5 of cash coming in and then we had what we had the uh, par value of the common shares remember was ten dollars per share so we issue those for their par value the um, preferred was fifty dollars per share and then since we allocated what fifty four hundred to the common the amount over par goes to paid in capital in excess of par common twenty four hundred since we allocated um you know eighty one hundred and we've already put 5,000 to the par, the remaining 3,100 is going to go to the uh, additional paid in capital. That to me seems like a very, you know, accountant's rational way of going about this. This uh, incremental method, and I just, I guess what bothers me about it is it just kind of sits there and says, well, the common shares gotta go first. Okay, I don't know why. Well, you know, what's the logic there? But okay, if you insist. And then, and since we got 13.5 total and we took six to the common, the remaining is going to go uh, to the preferred. Okay, this seems a bit arbitrary to me, but if they do that, then you go ahead and, of course, amounts over par um, uh, that you allocated to each would go to each respective additional paid in capital. Okay. Whatever, I, I'm i sure both methods, or maybe I'm being overly uh, dramatic here. I like the um, the proportional method seems to make better sense to me, but okay, if they wanna do it this way, that's fine. Okay, okay, good. So let's go ahead and see what happens when we issue stock for a non-cash transaction. So what happens? Let's use our imagination a little bit. Let's say um, you're just starting out a company and you're looking and you realize you're going to open a restaurant and you realize that you need a big, you know, industry standard refrigerator. Okay, we're making this all up. And um, you look at the refrigerator that you need and you're like, wow, that's really expensive for that refrigerator. So you go to, you know, you probably couldn't walk into a big outfit like uh, Best Buy or something like that and do this, but you go to a smaller appliance dealer and you say, look, um, would you be willing to take some shares of stock in exchange for this refrigerator? Okay, now what's going to happen? The dealer is going to look and say, well, what's the value of your stock? And you're going to say, well, I don't know, you know, what the market value is. I'm a happening. Look at me, you know, look at my, I just put on my bow tie. I'm going to be, you know, doing well here. And I say bow tie because, you know, that kind of sounds like the really fancy tie on a tuxedo or whatever, right? Uh, you know, I'm not happening, right? And so... 
Um, little do they know it's a clip on, right? So then what? So then, you know, the person looks and they take pity on you, whatever, and they say, okay, I'll take your shares of stock, okay? And I don't really know the value of your stock because I'm the first guy you've issued any stock to, but I want $8,000, $10,000 for this refrigerator, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to leverage the value of that transaction off of that refrigerator because the refrigerator has the more readily determined value because this guy is churning out refrigerators all the time, right? So in that case, you would leverage off of the refrigerator, okay? Now, let's say you're a big corporation and your stock is trading daily and you go and you're going to get a delivery truck and you work out a deal with the um, company or you're going to get a fleet of delivery trucks and you work out a deal with the company that for this fleet of delivery trucks, right, I'll issue you so many shares of stock. Well, you know, these delivery trucks have different prices depending on the volume of business you do, how good you are negotiating the deal, etc. Whereas the stock trades daily. Each day they ring a bell at the end. That's not a very good bell. Okay, they ring a bell at the end of the day and everyone agrees to the price of that stock that's traded on one of the stock exchanges it's publicly traded. Well, in that case, the stock has the more readily determined value. So you would take the market value of the stock times the number of shares. That's what you would bring the refrigerator on it. And then, um, you know, you would credit the stock at par. And of course, the amount over and above the market price of that stock that's being traded daily for the par value goes to the additional paid in capital, okay? So that's a long-winded way of saying that when you're issuing stock for property, use the fair value of the stock or the fair value of and in the example i gave we were acquiring asset it could be a service you could be having that same conversation with an attorney that helped you to set something up when you're starting your business you would do what debit startup cost and expense or debit uh, legal services and expense and credit the common stock and additional paying capital accordingly whichever has the more readily determined value, okay? Okay, good, so let's just go ahead and let's take a quick look at a couple of things here. And in the first case, um, we cannot determine the uh, value of this patent they're acquiring, but the stock has a readily determined value. So you leverage off the stock's value, okay? The stock has a value of 140,000, so that's what you're valuing the patent at. You, of course, issue the common stock at par, okay? And uh, that's that. And then the additional paying capital is the amount over the uh, par value that you issued that stock for, which if it had a par value of 100,000 and we said the market value was 140,000, we have paid in capital in excess of par of 40,000. And you bring in the patent now at the value of the stock. Okay, now I think you know where this is going. Here now we're issuing oops, the 10,000 shares, and uh, this time though the uh, patent has the more readily determined value. Fine, then you leverage off the patent, issue the common stock at par. The APIC in that case is the remainder uh, that uh, goes into additional paid in capital. Okay, and again, I think here they use the value of the patent, whatever. Whichever has what? The more readily determined value. Uh, however you determine that using just town and cash flows, the problem will just give you, if I gave you something like that, the value of the uh, asset, or don't forget it could be the value of a service, okay? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at uh, some of the uh, cost of issuing stock, okay? Those are going to be subtracted from the additional paid in capital. So if you have to pay some sort of underwriting cost, underwriting costs typically come up um, in a lot in initial public offerings. These uh, underwriters help you take the stock to market, will help you find the appropriate price and whatnot. They charge a fee for that, so when you issue the stock, you're going to have to take off a chunk of the money that you get from that issuance and hand it to these underwriters. They make a lot of money. You're going to hand it to these underwriters and the underwriter uh, gets walks away with their fee 
you now have from an accounting standpoint the cash that you received after you paid the underwriters you're of course going to issue that stock at the par that very low number and then the additional paid in capital and excess of par will be whatever is left over that you were able to keep the cash minus the par the difference will go to additional paid in capital and the underwriter uh, walks off with their chunk of dough so you really leverage off of the net that you get off of uh, the issue after you pay cost of this nature and um, you know they mentioned uh, printing cost I don't know to what extent there's a whole lot of printing these days etc but to so on okay okay good um, so we have spent some time talking a little bit about preferred but what we really want to dig in here as we start to talk about the preferred is the nature of the preferences and the big ones that um, the big one that we'll talk about in this class is how we treat preferences related to dividends okay there are other preferences such as liquidation and whatnot that we've talked about a couple times I think for our purposes the big deal is the dividend okay um, and so we'll get into that uh, coming up uh, full disclosure here guys I think I wanted this slide to be one up so hold your thought for a minute on preferred and let's finish our discussion of the common shares um, okay so um, and I kind of debated I think where to put this slide that's why I kind of ended up in a weird spot here because we're going to be dealing with analysis of uh, stock at the end of the chapter here at the end of our slides and I thought about putting it there but then I thought well maybe it should cap off the discussion of common so I put it here and then I put it in the wrong place anyway uh, book value per common share is what I'm trying to get to here okay and uh, notice guys first off in the denominator we use the number of shares that are uh, outstanding okay remember we said authorized issued outstanding outstanding is the number of shares issued minus the uh, treasury stock right so we have to leverage off the number of shares outstanding okay and then come down here for this numerator okay common shareholders equity it's the total shareholders equity what is total shareholders equity the what the paid in capital the earned capital right okay but they adjust that by saying what minus preferred share stock outstanding at the greater of their uh, call price or par value and any cumulative preferred dividends in arrears that then gives you the common shareholders equity that goes into that uh, numerator okay so we got to back out the preferred stock that's outstanding and I would tell you whatever its par value is generally we'll just call it the par value there could be a call price but generally we'll talk about a par value and then you would have to subtract out any cumulative dividends in arrear that gives you the amount of total shareholders equity available to the common shareholders divide that by the common shareholders outstanding and that's going to give you book value uh, per common share okay all right good now let's go ahead now continue our discussion here about preferred stock and preferred stock could be cumulative cumulative and we're going to look at an example but cumulative means that if dividends are not paid in a given year they accumulate and will have to be paid out before anything can be paid out to the common shareholders thus the term cumulative okay participating means that after we catch up our common shareholders so we paid out the cumulative to the preferred there's still an amount of dividend left over right now what happens now we go and we catch up the common shareholders and then if the preferred stock is participating they will participate on a proportional basis any amount that is left over between them and the common shareholders so you could have preferred non-cumulative you could have preferred cumulative but not participating you could have cumulative uh, preferred cumulative and participating 
Okay, convertible means that you can convert the uh, preferred stock to uh, to common stock. We won't get much into that. Callable means that it is callable by the issuer, and redeemable means that there's some sort of uh, warrants or something that are attached to that stock that allow you to redeem them at some point for additional shares, etc. Okay, and so they can attach preferences for dividends. Uh, restrictions. Generally, the restriction is uh, uh, voting, as we've mentioned, uh, whichever is applicable to the particular uh, state law. Okay, so when we issue the preferred guys, nothing significantly different there from what we've talked about with issuing the common. You just go ahead and uh, set up your uh, preferred stock at par and then the additional paid in capital in excess of par. Instead of it being now for the common stock, it's the preferred, which is it's $2 per share over the $10 par value. Okay, market was uh, 12. Okay, all right, good. Okay, nothing uh, earth shattering there. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at how these cumulative preferred, non-cumulative preferred participating non-participating and then the example that we're going to look at is going to assume i don't want to go to the example yet the example that we're going to look at is uh, going to assume that the stock is cumulative and participating okay and that uh, that can happen okay or it could be just one of these or none of these well it could be none of these because it would if it was non if it's if it's non-participating then it's not participating if it's non-cumulative then it's not cumulative you get the point okay so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at uh, what we say about cumulative first let's understand that okay so i'm just going to highlight that and read through that carefully with you okay the cumulative feature provides that all or part of preferred stock not paid in any year accumulates and must be paid in future years before dividends can be paid to common shareholders, okay? So the preferred will have an amount of dividend that accumulates, and if the, even if the company, if the company doesn't pay it in a year, it accumulates, it would have to be paid out in a later year, and it still accumulates even if it's not declared. However, if it's not declared, they don't have to book a liability for dividend payable, but it still accumulates. So that's why they're focusing on the paid there. It accumulates if it's what well, if it's declared and it accumulates and it's not paid, uh, then there's a, a liability. If it's not declared, it still accumulates. So that's why they're focusing on the word paid there. Okay. The accumulated amount is referred to as dividends in arrears. And the amount of dividends in arrears is not a legal liability unless they declare it. But typically in questions, they'll just say nothing was paid. And so they're not asking about the liability. They just want to see if you can figure out what accumulated. Okay. However, uh, so it's not a legal liability, but it must be disclosed unless they actually declared it. But uh, that's, that's probably not... The way you see those described there's probably it's either declared if it's not declared it can't be paid and if it's not paid it accumulates okay now with non-cumulative hey too bad okay um the preferred shareholders lose the right to receive dividends that are not declared so the what period goes by, it's not cumulative, they didn't clear the dividend, you lose out on that year's share of your preferred dividends, okay? With participating, what happens? What we do with participating, and I'm just gonna highlight this for you, but I'm not gonna read it, okay? What we do with, because we got a beautiful example on the next page, but what we do with participating is we go ahead, we catch up our preferred shareholders for any dividends they're entitled to that are in arrears or for the current year. We catch them up. Then there's an amount left over. So we pay them out. Then there's an amount left over and we distribute an equal amount of dividend to the common shareholders. And then if they're still 
a pot of money left over. Then we go ahead and we distribute that proportionately to the common and the uh, preferred shareholders. Okay, and then if it's not participating, you know, they simply don't participate. That's it. They're limited to whatever they get as their dividend paid out that uh, accumulates in arrears, etc. Unless it's not cumulative, but they don't participate on that extra pot of money after we've uh, caught up the um, common shareholders. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead, and I think this example helps a lot. Okay. So the company declares a cash dividend of one hundred and one thousand dollars. Okay. Now our first job, January first, Samuel Company issued hundred thousand shares, five dollar par common stock, and twenty five thousand ten dollar par value, uh, fully participating eight percent cumulative preferred stock. No dividends were paid in year one, and then they pay cash dividends of 101, as you saw down there, in year two. Okay, so what happens? Well, the way you figure out the preferred dividend, first thing here is to take the par value times the number of shares times whatever they tell you the uh, percent is, and that's given for the stock that uh, was issued, whatever. In this case, they tell us it was 8%. So they've got 20,000 coming. That's year one, because we have to catch them up, because it said it was what? Fully participating and cumulative, right? So we got to catch them up for year one, because no dividends were paid in year one. We pay the dividend in year two, so they accumulate their year two amount same calculation okay they get the amount for year two and there's that pot of money sixty one thousand that is left over now what do we do we have to catch up the common shareholders so since we had a hundred thousand shares five dollars each we got to give them eight percent of their par value that we're leveraging off of here, and that's that 8%. So now they got their share considering an 8% amount on whatever the par value was, but there's still, what, 21,000 left over. So how are we gonna distribute that 21,000 in this fully participating cumulative situation for the um, preferred stock? And so notice that what, we had par value of 250,000 for our preferred stock, okay? We have par value of 500,000 for our um, common stock. And just looking back to see where those numbers came from, we have what, 100,000 times $5, and we have what, $10 par times 25,000 shares, right? 100,000 shares times $5, 25,000 shares times $10, respectively 500,000 for the common, 250,000 for the preferred, of course 500 plus um, 250 gives me the denominator here of 750. And so proportionately, remember that 21,000 that was left over, um, uh, proportionately 7,000 should go to the preferred shareholders, 14 to the common shareholders. And then down here, if you know they said and generally if I ask you a question on this I'll say what was the amount that went to the preferred what was the amount that went to the common shareholders might be the ultimate question there you know the 20s the two arrear the amount in the arrears the amount for year two the amount in arrears for year one the two 20s 7,000 which we just calculated up there and then the catch up for the common shareholders at the 8% and then the 14 that we just calculated up there for the common Okay, nice little example, and it gives you the sense as to how we accumulate um, dividends, cumulative dividends in arrears, how we pay those out to the preferred shareholders, and then it also helps illustrate how participating works. So that's a nice little example. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and talk about reacquisition of shares, but I'll tell you, I'm going to go ahead and suggest a quick little um, break for us. So once you go ahead and uh, pause the recording, I'm gonna pause and we'll be right back. You go ahead and take a little break, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's move on to discussion of reacquisition of shares. And um, 
This reacquisition of shares is um, called treasury stock. So you probably have, have heard of um, you know treasury stock or tr uh, share buybacks, that sort of thing. Um, we call that um, treasury stock and that's the way we're going to be disclosing that on our financial reports. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look as to why companies will um, reacquire their own shares of stock. Uh, sometimes there are tax advantages to uh, distributions that are essentially made to shareholders. Let me explain what's going on. We go back into the market and we reacquire our shares of stock from our current shareholders. Okay, they call that buyback. Uh, we call it treasury stock. Okay, and when that happens, there, it's a way of getting cash to our shareholders. It has certain tax advantages, although changes in the tax law, and this is not a tax class, I make those have, have diminished some of those advantages to some extent, but there could be certain tax benefits to doing that. Uh, increasing our earnings per share, and I think that's part of the reason I put that um, per share, book value per share. If you reduce the number of shares, your earnings per share will go up, your book value per share uh, will be influenced by that, etc. Okay, um, there could be situation where we want shares for stock, uh, for employee stock compensation. Um, if we're trying to thwart a takeover, just take those shares off the um, market. Now we don't have a dissolution or delusion of our um, uh, um, of our uh, voting stock, right? Because we're able to take those off the market. Um, and maybe the, the biggest reason is a simple supply and demand, number five here. You reacquire those shares, that's less shares that are in the market. The fewer shares that are in the market, cut back the supply. What happens if demand holds constant, the price should go up. So uh, different ways, uh, reasons, I guess, that uh, somebody, a company might detire, decide to uh, purchase treasury stock. Now, when we look at the uh, treasury stock, we're going to look at two methods. One, well, we're not going to look at two. We're really going to just focus on one, but there are two methods, the uh, cost method and the par value method. I've seen some statistics that say 95%, and I don't know how you know precise those uh, estimates are. I don't know that they do a survey you know, of companies or if there's some sort of sampling of annual reports that they use to come up with these numbers, but I've seen published, uh, people will say 95% of the companies will use the cost method. So we're gonna focus on that. I don't think that uh, it's, it's disputed that it is more uh, widely used, okay? And then we're gonna see that whatever the amount of treasury stock is, it's going to reduce the amount of our stockholders equity it's subtracted off that stockholders equity and we saw that in that one graphic earlier where you saw the amount of treasury stock being subtracted off of the stockholders equity okay okay so you can see the stockholders equity for this company here we've got our common stock the paid in capital we've got um i guess they don't have any uh I don't see any preferred stock here. That's fine. You don't have to have it. We've got our retained earnings and then our total stockholders equity. So pretty, pretty simple, basic uh, stockholders equity of this company. Okay. Now they turn around and they reacquire some shares of their own stock and they reacquire it at $11 per share. Very simple calculation, guys. You have to obviously credit the cash for the 110,000, 10,000 shares at $11 per, and then you debit the treasury stock account 110,000. Now the treasury stock account is a contra stockholders equity. It's gonna be subtract from your stockholders equity. So we take a look back at that stockholders equity that we were looking at earlier, and now we have what? All the same information is there, except we've added this red, underline here we've added this which is a, which is a subtract uh, for the uh, treasury stock so i could give you a problem where i could say hey um, the amount of common stock is this the additional paid in capital is that the retained earnings is this the treasury stock is x 
what is the total stockholders equity and it would be what the common stock the additional paid in capital the retained earnings add those together minus what minus the amount that was paid out for that treasury stock whatever it was per share times the number of shares that's it okay all right now what happens once you have uh, acquired this treasury stock now you have it and you can reissue the treasury stock and when you reissue or sell that treasury stock back out in the market maybe it's not a re maybe reissue is not the correct word you issued it initially you bought your own stock that's treasury stock and then you sell it sale of treasury stock is a better term really it's not being newly issued it's kind of like reissuing it because it's your stock and you're putting it back on the market but the correct term is sale of the treasury stock you can sell it above cost or you can sell it below cost now when you sell it above cost you will create an account called additional paid in capital treasury stock so if you sell it above that eleven dollars that we had in that example that's going to create this paid in account called paid in capital treasury stock okay now that's if you resell it at above the initial cost the eleven dollars in this example if you sell the stock below resell that stock below sell that stock below the um, initial cost below that eleven dollars you're going to first take that difference against any available paid in capital treasury stock and to the extent that you use that all up then you will take that against your retained earnings because it's seen as though you're really distributing like a dividend to your client now because now you're reselling them to their stock for less than you paid for it so in a sense that's like a distribution of a dividend anyway once you wipe out that paid in capital treasury stock any additional amounts below the original cost go to your uh, retained earnings all right so let's just take a look at how that would work and um, we take a look and we have the treasury stock that we bought for eleven dollars per share and then we're able to sell a thousand shares of that for uh, fifteen dollars so we bought them back at uh, at eleven dollars per share the price went up to 15 we grabbed a thousand of those ten thousand and we're gonna sell them now man we made some money at fifteen dollars per share right so what do we do obviously we're gonna get fifteen thousand cash a thousand times fifteen is fifteen thousand we have to bring back out the treasury stock now and we bring it out at that original cost it was eleven dollars per share a thousand times eleven i think you know well, john you don't need to do this is what times the eleven dollars is eleven thousand hello everybody knows that and the difference goes to what that account that i talked about paid in capital from treasury stock that's that uh, four thousand dollars now the way i like to do these problems when you're looking at the practice midterm and stuff and i could give you all in one problem hey they bought it for 11 they sold it for 15 uh, then I might have a situation where they sell some more at a different price and then I'm going to ask you at the end what's the amount in the um, and again I'm going to call it a pick TS is treasury stock right is 4,000 and what I would do in a problem where they're sitting there and they're giving me a bunch of different things that are going on with the uh, treasury stock sales acquisition and then resale is I just start keeping track of this APIC treasury stock account because I know that I'm going to be limited to uh, this 4,000 and once it closes out any additional amounts under that reacquisition price of $11 got to go to retain earnings right so I go ahead and I have this account here APIC treasury stock 4,000 right okay so then what then they sell a thousand shares an additional thousand shares but now eight dollars so i'm only going to get eight thousand in cash here i still take the treasury stock out at the original reacquisition price a thousand times the eleven dollars right that's eleven thousand and because i have what in my apic treasury stock i'll write it up here again 
Okay, because I still have what? 4,000 sitting there, I can debit that difference between the original reacquisition price and this $8, the 11 and the 8. I can go ahead and I can uh, debit paid in capital from treasury stock for 3,000 because I still have what? I still got a thousand dollar balance sitting in there, don't I? Available to me, okay? Then what happens? Then they go and they sell another thousand shares. And again, these are at $8. So here comes the 8,000. Then what? There goes my another share, thousand dollars times $11 per share. There's that 11,000, gotta come out at that original amount. And then I'm limited to what? I'm limited to, I gotta go back here to this thousand, right? Okay, so I go ahead and I debit that for a thousand. The remaining 2,000 gotta go to retain earnings. And now, anytime I sell that below the $11, that'll come out of retained earnings. Now, if I turn around and I start selling it, what? For more than the 11, okay? Sell it for more than the 11, then I would start creating the paid in capital treasury stock number again. And we would sort of yo yo back and forth as we uh, do these different transactions uh, with the treasury stock, okay? That's the cost method. We're not doing the par value method here, so just worry about the cost method, okay? All right, good. Let's take a look now and see what we wanna do related to dividends, okay? And, um, you know, companies have different policies about dividends. There's no requirement that you pay a dividend, okay? Companies may or may not pay depends on their earnings, depends on whether they're retaining their earnings for future projects. And I think sometimes we just sort of need, you know, knee jerk to this idea, well, I want a dividend. Well, you know, some investors may look and say, I don't want a dividend, man. I just handed you $1,000 to buy some of your stock. I don't need you to start trickling that money back to me now. What I need you to do is keep that money keep it invested in the company. I'm buying this as a growth stock. I want to see the market value of this stock go up. So if you're a company that's investing in some sort of research development and whatnot, keep going, keep that cash, keep that going because we know that at some point there's going to be an issuance of a patent and that's going to significantly increase the market value of the stock and I'm in for the long-term game. So don't pay me a dividend. Other people, maybe someone more my age, is saying, hey, I'm getting to a point where I just want to relax and collect a check, pay me a dividend, okay? So what ends up happening is a company's dividend policy could depend on how investors look at the company, et cetera, right? And so it's important that uh, to the SEC that companies disclose their dividend policy so that the investing public can make decisions along the nature of what I was talking about there. If they've paid dividends in the past and they're not going to, what's the reasons for that? All important information that the Security Exchange Commission would like to see um, investors know. So they ask, they encourage uh, disclosure about dividend policy, okay? Now, when we look at dividends, we could have um, cash dividend, most common. But there could also be property dividend. And then if we distribute in a dividend more dividends, okay, I'll slow down a little bit. Dividends get paid out of retained earnings. They get paid out of retained earnings, okay? Now, when we pay those, we could pay them in the form of cash. We could pay them in the form of some sort of property, but they're coming out of the retained earnings, right? Dividend means divide. So what am I doing? I'm taking my earnings and I'm dividing it amongst my shareholders. If I don't divide my earnings, I'm retaining them. So I'm paying my what? I'm paying my dividend out of my retained earnings as I distribute it out of my retained earnings. I'm dividing my retained earnings amongst my shareholders. So a liquidating dividend says, hey, you just paid out dividends in excess of your retained earnings. We're going to see that that's not going to come out of retained earnings. That's going to come out of paid in capital. Okay. Okay, good. So, and we call that a liquidating dividend. So let's go ahead, Don. Let's just take a look at, uh, you know, the most common situation with cash dividend we're going to use as an example. And there are three dates that you're going to have to know the definition of. Declaration date is the day we declare the dividend. 
At that time, we will debit retain earnings and we will credit dividend payable. It is a liability. Date of record fixes the date that we're going to pay the dividend to individuals that are holding the stock at that point in time. So if we have um, declaration, say, I don't know, December 25th, and the dividend's not going to be paid until um, January 31st of the next year, but we have a date of record of uh, January 15th, what happens? On December 31st, we go ahead, we make the journal entry debit retained earnings, credit dividend payable, right? On January 15th, if I hold that stock, the dividend is going to be paid to me on January 31st, regardless of who holds the stock on January 31st. So let's say I say, hey, want to buy a stock? And I sell you that stock on January 17th. Guess what? That dividend is going to be paid to me on January 31st. Okay, so what happens if I sold to you on January 17th after the date of record? I'm getting that dividend. So you'd want to buy that stock, what? Before the date of record so that you would get the dividend in that situation, okay? But at the date of record, the company is not making an accounting dollar and set journal entry, so there's no debit, there's no credit. There's simply a notation of who holds the stock at that date. There's nothing entered into the journals for that. And then, of course, on the date of payment, we'll debit the um, dividend payable, we'll credit the cash, okay? And that's what's illustrated here. It's 50 cents that's going to be paid on uh, a share of 1.8 million shares. They don't say here the shares outstanding. I could give you a question where I tell you the number of shares authorized, issued, and outstanding. The dividend, even though they're not saying here, would be paid on these 1.8 million shares. That's what's considered to be outstanding, okay? 50 cents, they don't say it there, but it's paid on the outstanding shares, 50 cents times 1.8 is 900,000. We go ahead, we debit retain earnings on the date of declaration, right? 1.8 times 50 cents, 900,000. Debit retain earnings, credit dividend payable. On the date of record, when we say no entry, we mean in the accounting records. They're gonna know John Lord holds this stock on June 21st, uh, 24th, and then when they finally pay that dividend in July, obviously credit the cash and debit the dividend payable. That, of course, is assuming um, that we have paid a cash dividend. We could pay a property dividend, and the property dividend has two steps, because before you distribute that property, you have to calculate the gain or loss on that property, then you distribute it at its fair market value. So in this example here now, we had this stock, uh, this property that was being distributed, that had a, um, you know, it was being carried on the books, a book value of 1.5, market value is 2, so we have to first book the gain on that investment. So I guess we're going to distribute some stock that we hold, not our own stock, but stock that we hold in another company, and so we're going to go ahead and distribute that as a dividend, okay? Then what? Then we go ahead and uh, we set up the dividend at the fair market value, right? Because we're distributing stock that has a fair market value of $2 million, okay? It's distributing the stock investment that has a market value of $2 million, debit to retain earnings, credit to dividend payable. Again, we're not distributing our own stock now here. This is stock that we hold in another company as an investment. But we first booked the gain, and this would be the case of any property. I don't care if we were distributing iPhones. We are Apple. We're distributing $2 million worth of iPhones, but they have an inventory book value of 1.2. We first would book the gain. Then we would go ahead and uh, take out the dividend at fair value. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, you could also have a, um, and then of course you go ahead and you distribute the dividend, debiting the payable and crediting whatever you're distributing. Just like before it was cash, now it's these uh, investments, okay, investment asset, okay? Okay, good. Now, if we have a liquidating dividend, means simply means we're distributing more than what is in our retained earnings. So when you look at this example, they wanted to distribute a dividend of 1.2 million. They only had 900,000 in the retained earnings. 
So the difference came from the paid in capital. And then when you pay that, you did it the payable and a credit and this assuming a cash dividend. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about stock dividends here. And when we look at stock dividends, we look at them in uh, two categories, a small stock dividend, large stock dividend. Small stock dividend means that we're distributing less than 20 to 25% of the uh, stock. Okay, now you look at that and you say, well, what if it's 22.5%? That's considered a small dividend, okay? When I give you questions, we're gonna be clearly over that 25%, okay? So it's an amount that has crossed the 25% threshold, 30%, 40%, something like that. That's considered a, uh, when it's less than 25%, that's considered a, a small stock dividend. And the problems that I'll give you, it'll be clearly over the 25%. If that's the case, if it's a small stock dividend, then we're gonna distribute that dividend at the market value of the stock. When we get to the discussion of large in a minute, that means that it's what? It's going to be over that 25%, say what? Say a 30% uh, or something, then it's considered a large stock dividend and we're gonna distribute that at the par value of the stock. And we'll look at an example of that here in a minute, okay? Okay, good, so let's first look at the small and we know it's small because they tell me 10%. See how we're well, below that we don't mess around in that middle between 20 and 25 we're way well below that um you know 25 percent uh kind of threshold so i don't have you sort of guessing in the middle okay so it's less than clearly less than 20 percent and so i don't have you sitting here saying well what would i do with 22.5 when i want you to know that it's a large it's going to be well over the uh, 25 percent end of that range okay okay good so we're sitting here and we've got what we've got this 10 percent okay and the market value of the stock is 130 dollars per share we're going to issue stock dividend of 100 shares we debit the retained earnings just like we would for a cash dividend, but instead of crediting the liability uh, dividend payable, we credit common stock distributable. That is a contra stockholders equity account, okay? So we call that common stock distributable 10,000, and then we go ahead and we credit our paid in capital in excess of par common three thousand uh, dollars uh, I shouldn't say it's a contra it's going to be a stockholders equity account it's not a contra it's going to increase my stockholders equity uh, so I'm crediting it but it's a stockholders equity account it is not a liability so uh, in effect declaring a stock dividend does what it has no effect on my stockholders equity at all my retained earnings comes down my common stock distributable and my paid in capital in excess of par common comes up okay for the difference between the par of the stock the par was a uh, hundred dollars um, okay and the market value was 130 so I credit the common stock distributable at the par the amount over par goes into my paid in capital right then when I issue the shares of stock I simply go ahead and debit that common stock distributable and credit the common stock for the 10,000 when I finally get around to issuing those. But that entire set of transactions happens where? In the stockholders equity section, okay? And I misspoke, that's not a contra, it adds to my stockholders equity. Then here I take it out of one stockholders equity account and put it into another, okay? Okay, good, now that's the small stock dividend, okay? We could have a stock split. Stock split has no effect on the stockholder's equity, okay? All we do is cut the price of the stock, and in a two-for-one stock split, we cut the price in half, okay, the par value in half, but we double the number of shares, and so that keeps what? That keeps the total stockholder's equity the same. It doesn't change. 100,000, 100,000 plus the retained earnings is not affected by that. Okay, that's a stock split. 
Now, what happens, why would you say, well, why would you do this? Well, maybe my par value is getting a little high for that stock, and I'm worried that that high par value is somehow going to affect the marketability of that stock, and so what do I do? I bring down that par value to make it more attractive to investors that won't be shied away from a higher par value. By making that par value lower, the perception is, is that stock is maybe made more affordable, and so individuals are now willing to buy a stock that has a $50 par value as opposed to a hundred. Okay, so it really would serve to probably reduce the market value of the stock at least tempor temporarily. Uh, the hope is that as more investors now get attracted to that stock as that market value comes down, um, that eventually that'll drive up demand and actually the price of the stock will continue to increase at a nice steady rate for us. So it has more to do with marketing than it does with accounting. There's no journal entry associated with that because no dollar amounts in the stockholders' equity have changed. Okay. Now, we said there could be a what? A large stock dividend. We say it's more than 20 to 25%. Again, I'm not going to make you mess in the middle here and say, well, is it small, large or small because it's 22? I'm going to be putting you well over the 25% when I want you to treat it as a large stock dividend. Okay? So what happens? Here we are dealing with what? And please don't make a liar out of me here. They're dealing with the stock, uh, and it's a large stock dividend. There we go, 30%. Okay, we know it's large because they went to 30%. So what happens? If they had a million shares that were outstanding, they went with a 30% stock dividend. So that means what? They're going to distribute an additional 300,000 shares. So there's the additional shares. And they use par value because it's a large stock dividend, $10 par value times the 300,000 shares. You simply debit common stock distributable, $3 million, credit the common stock, um, $3 million, and uh, we're done. We don't have to deal with any additional paid in capital or anything of that nature because we're simply um, uh, distributing those shares. Um, well, debit the retained earnings, Debit, I probably should have pointed to that. First we do this, and then we do this. Debit the retained earnings, credit the common stock distributable. Then when you issue the stock, debit the common stock distributable, credit the common stock. The big takeaway here, guys, is we ignored what? We ignored the fair value. We just used the par value for a large stock dividend. Okay? All right. Presentation. Okay, you can see how that would look okay notice we subtract the treasury stock we talked about that already you can see how they uh, went ahead and set up their stockholders equity section there nothing terribly uh, interesting there to give you uh, some information about what needs to be presented and the big thing here is restrictions on retain earnings okay so if there are restrictions on retain earnings um, for example, let's say I want my shareholders to understand that I'm not going to be able to pay a dividend for a while because I'm saving some of my retained earnings for a big project where we're going to be building a new plant facility or something, you know, off, off like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, my retained earnings, okay, can be appropriated. or unappropriated. Okay, now if my retained earnings is appropriated for something like the use of this building, let's uh, to, to uh, pay for this building that I plan to build, then what I'll do is I will debit my unappropriated For say a million dollars, eh. and I'll credit my appropriated. For say 
a million dollars, whatever. And then I might even put note three or note two or whatever it is. And of course, this note isn't going to line up with my example. But um, then I would explain in a footnote, I have this appropriation for this building of my retained earnings, da, da, da. So now if you're a potential investor and the SEC has said, hey, you need to disclose these things, I'm looking and saying, okay, yeah, I'm fine. Wow, that new building, new factory building is going to increase productivity for the company, etc. That sounds like a good project. I've been reading in the press what they're talking about doing here. This is a growth stock. I'm a young person. I want to invest in this. Me, I'm looking and saying, it's going to be a while before I see any dividend out of these guys. And I need to be sitting in my backyard, you know, just drinking tea. Okay. And so I don't want to sit here and wait for a dividend. I may not be alive by the time these guys get around to paying a dividend. And so they're probably not my company. Okay. And you can see a stockholder's equity has a whole lot of information in it. Uh, some of it uh, stuff that we've dealt with in other classes. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let's take a look at some ratios. I showed you book value per share earlier. Let's take a look at a couple of others. Nothing uh, terribly complicated here. Uh, rate of return on common stock. We need to take the net income minus preferred dividends, and that would include any preferred dividends in arrears. Those get subtracted from the net income. That gives me the amount of um, um, the amount of uh, uh, income available to my common shareholders. Thank you, and I divide that by the average common shareholders' equity. That's the beginning balance of my common shareholders' equity, um, plus the ending balance, and I divide that by two. That give me my average common shareholders equity, which we saw how we would calculate that uh, before where we were taking off a certain amount of the preferred shares, etc. Okay, then we could have cash div uh, the payout ratio is going to be my cash dividend divided by my net income. And um, then if we were to look at our um, book value per share. Uh, I gave you an example of that uh, a little bit earlier, so we've considered the book value per share on another uh, slide. Okay? Okay, guys, I think that is our lecture. Okay? I gave you the book value per share on, on the earlier slide. I could have put it down here, but I decided to put it up there. Okay? All right, guys, that is it for Chapter 15. Stay tuned for two things. The uh, practice midterm, I'll be putting a discussion up there pretty quickly here. And then don't forget the guest speakers on Monday. I've given you the information about that. You need to be looking at that and make every uh, effort you can to be there live. If you can't be there live, I've given you some instructions on that. Okay. All right, guys, have a good uh, rest of the day and I will talk to you a little bit later.